the attendant on my life has left me scarred and deformed. But I assure you, my resolve has never been stronger. So, from that intro, you could probably guess where this video is going. It wasn't exactly something that I had in mind, but as it was suggested to me by one of my followers, and I thought about it, and I realized that I couldn't resist this opportunity. And just to get a few things out of the way, I'm not going to go into any of my political opinions on this whole situation, although I may sprinkle an opinion or two here and there, but I think those are pretty well-known objectable facts, the ones I'll bring up later on. I'm also aware that this video is more than likely going to anger some people, and I can't control how people respond to this. If you don't like anything that I have to say, obviously, of course, that's your right. But I'm not here today to tell you how you should feel about a certain candidate or whatever. This is just something that I've been able to pick up on and observe over the last eight years. I had a chance recently to watch Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. If you want to know my full thoughts on it, you can check out my review here. But this is considered by many in the Star Wars fandom to be among the best in the series. Watching the movie again recently, I couldn't help but pick up on certain political undertones that George Lucas sprinkles throughout here. In fact, in light of the current state of affairs in the American political system, I would say that Star Wars Episode 3 is the most politically relevant. Star Wars has been no stranger to political commentary of some kind. All three trilogies have some kind of political imagery in there somewhere. And despite what many Star Wars fans today will tell you, the sequel trilogy has the least amount of politics. The only overt ones that I picked up on from watching all three of them is the military rally scene where General Hux gives that passionate speech on Starkiller Base. Might as well have been ripped right out of Nazi Germany during one of Hitler's speeches. Then with The Last Jedi and the Canto Bite scenes, I guess if you have to pick very, very obvious political messaging in that trilogy, that's probably the biggest one. Even with all that, I didn't really have a problem with the messaging there. And The Rise of Skywalker doesn't really have any of that stuff. It's just one big giant crescendo where the Resistance teams up with the rest of the galaxy to defeat the Emperor once and for all. People tend to say that the sequels are the most politically overt because of the ethnicity and gender of the main characters, Rey, Finn, and Poe. Most people don't really feel this way, but there's certain people in the Star Wars fandom that do. Even with all those things in mind with the sequels, I don't really think it's unheard of when you think about it in the context of the entire franchise. George Lucas has been very open and honest about his own political views and how he infuses them into the Star Wars franchise. It isn't the science, aliens, and all that kind of stuff that I get focused on. It's the, it's the how do the people react to all those things. And yeah. how do they accommodate them? Yeah. So that's the part that really fascinates me and I'm interested in. He's gone on record multiple times talking about how he's likened Richard Nixon to the Emperor in the original trilogy, and in the prequel trilogy where Anakin is George Bush and Dick Cheney is the Emperor, who manipulates him into doing what he wants. We've seen a huge push online lately on how certain pieces of entertainment are quote-unquote liberal or woke propaganda. Certain franchises and pieces of entertainment have gotten this kind of shellacking from certain talking heads in the YouTube sphere. The MCU, as of the last several years with Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, She-Hulk, Falcon and Winter Soldier, heck, even Black Panther in 2018 got accused by the right-wing media ecosystem for being pro-black and anti-white propaganda. The sequel trilogy for Star Wars and the Kenobi series even got accused of being quote-unquote woke propaganda or woke garbage. And even a show like The Last of Us, along with its counterpart in the video games, got accused of being that kind of propaganda too because it simply featured LGBTQ characters in both games. There are a lot more examples than just that. Obviously, there are a ton more, but certain YouTubers like Nerdrotic, Geeks and Gamers, and Critical Drinker are basically the poster children of the anti-woke crowd that has cemented its way into the social media ecosystem. So on the right. nose all the time? Right. In Star Wars, I don't know that this is like like the ways that they do it. <laughs> it's, it like, I, I th it's like, can I introduce you to my mother's? And then just looks at the camera right, like, right. this is perfectly fine. It's like, right. uh -huh, okay, it, I don't care. Can we just, can we just make a show and yeah. Right. It's that stuff of like, if you <laughs> acted normal. Even Critical Drinker has been interviewed by guys like Ben Shapiro, who I think is safe to say 
really started or played a key part in this kind of sentiment settling in the online world. Ben Shapiro is known as a right-wing commentator, but he's also known for giving movie reviews, and a lot of people would consider them to be really bad takes on movies since he only looks at it from a logical perspective and not necessarily from a creative perspective. So the entire plot of the episode is that Ron Swanson, Nick Offerman, but he actually plays Ron Swanson, but Ron Swanson who likes to nail dudes. Here's the problem with Brokeback Zombie Farm. One, it's a zombie show. There are no zombies in this entire episode. Like none. I understand sim simplistic critique, but there are no zombies in a zombie show. This is worth pointing out. It literally has nothing to do with the plot of the show. It just would have been a, a showtime romance between two middle-aged gay dudes. It is completely irrelevant to the story. And one of the reasons that it is completely irrelevant to the story is because there are no stakes. And the reason that there are no stakes is because, again, we are in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. When you're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, one of two issues has to come into play. One, the threat of the zombies. Or two, the threat to humanity more broadly. Again, there are only two issues in a zombie apocalypse. You could have this whole thing, but the whole thing is these two dudes in love, but they're fighting off zombies. But they never fight off the zombies. It's not an issue. So this entire episode is a, is a, is a sidestep. It has nothing to do with anything. Ellie and Joel could have just stopped by, found the house, picked up guns, and gone on their merry way. And it would have taken 10 seconds. Instead, you get an entire hour-long digression to do, as I say again, La Caja Falls or whatever this is. This is a guy who claims that Hollywood rejected him simply because he's a conservative. He's a horrible screenwriter who doesn't know how to craft a good screenplay. Ben Shapiro has literally no idea what he's <laughs> talking about. I different on a whole host of things. And at the media outlet that he runs, The Daily Wire, other people that he's worked with over the years will do a very similar thing, like Candace Owens, who has her own talk show now, Michael Knowles, Matt Walsh. Don't even get me started on Joe Rogan, who's practically one of the biggest MAGA enablers out there right now. You know, recognize that some serious errors were made and not repeat those. That's the best you can get out of it. So what do you tell those people? Vote Republican. <laughs> That's what a lot of them are going to do anyway. And um, by the way, I'm not a Trump supporter in any way, shape, or form. I've had the opportunity to have him on my show more than once. I've said no every time. I don't want to help him. I'm not interested in helping the, him. The, the, the night is still young. We'll see. That election was so crooked. It was the most crooked election. Okay, but give me some examples of how. Well, let's start. Let's start okay. from the top and the easy ones. Okay. You know, you're, you're giving off the wrong signals. So you may be asking, why am I mentioning all this? Well, I think it has a lot to do with what's going on right now. This anti-woke sentiment that's settled in the online world, I think it's safe to say is a direct result of Trump's presidency. This has been going on long before he came into the political scene. It was only during his time in the White House and afterward that this just amplified even further. If you were to rewind back the clock, this kind of attitude towards diversity and entertainment has always existed. The villain in The Dark Knight Rises is named Bane. B-A-N-E. What is the name of the venture capital firm that Romney ran and around which there's now this make-believe controversy? Bain. The movie has been in the works for a long time. The release date's been known. Summer 2012 for a long time. Do you think that it is accidental that the name of the really vicious, fire-breathing, four-eyed, whatever it is, villain in this movie is named Bane. And even some people hated the casting of John Boyega as Finn in The Force Awakens simply because he was a black man playing a stormtrooper. But what really I think stems from all this, since things in the world have become a lot more inclusive in society by and large, entertainment has now started to reflect those changes. A lot of the people that, do, that would have done this trolling anyway are now staring a lot of change in the face. People are more emboldened about changing the way that things are in this world, about things that they don't like. Things are becoming more inclusive, and there's a large portion of the population that looks at inclusivity and only sees exclusivity. Because you're now including this person, that means you're gonna push me out. So I'm gonna fight you. And it's like, first of all, that's not true. Um, Secondly, inclusivity is not bad. As a matter of fact, you live in a very diverse world. A lot of them don't know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, Outside and the bubble. It's become very, very important for the ultra conservatives. And I'm going to dare say the Christian nationalists, mm -hmm. uh, without getting too political, because there's a, there's a foothold issue happening in this country mm -hmm. where um, they said that uh, within the next 20 years, as Gen Y stops going to organized churches, 
that you're going to see kind of a collapse of organized religion in many mm. ways in this country. Um, and also in the same census point, they said we probably should wait for the 2030 census, but that the the average white American will no longer be the majority of the uh, ethnicity in this country. So there's a lot of fear about losing power bases, about change, because, you know, as humans, we hate change. We do. We are going through, I think, this very tumultuous time demographically and america is becoming for the first time in her history a non-white european people yeah and that's that's serious business, it's well, serious like, business. There, there goes the neighborhood There's except the country right <laughs> this goes beyond the entertainment realm and what donald trump did while he was in office you go back to really fdr right and the fight against him the fight against lbj in the 60s the expansion of uh, social security and medicare the creation of all of that and this deliberate effort that's been happening for decades to push back about against the very concept of whether government itself itself can solve problems. This only grew even bigger with Ronald Reagan's comments on the government's role in our everyday lives. Nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Part of what he did, you point to, uh, was get rid of something called the Fairness Doctrine, which was essentially saying that the media, in order to have this license, we're giving you the airways, we're kind of giving you a monopoly, uh, but you need to show both sides show various perspectives and reagan said no we're taking that away and that led the way to a, a right-wing media infrastructure we have all of the right-wing outlets from from fox to oan to newsmax to daily wire a long time ago it started with rush limbaugh right. and and those outlets were focused solely on acting as propaganda arms for the republican party infusing a lot of these ideas into large swaths of the population that made people in the united states not trust the government even to the point of thinking that the government doesn't care about them. Listen to the reactions of the people at this rally for John McCain in 2008. Those people were aching for someone like Donald Trump to come into the picture. I have to tell you, he is a decent person and a person that you do not have to be scared as president of the United States. Now, I, I just, now I just, now, now look, I, I. Then in 2015, down comes the escalator, Donald Trump, who basically, says, nope, I'm not going to follow what the establishment was. I'm going to start my first press conference uh, with talking about rapists and murderers in Mexico. Uh, and he takes the party in a very different direction. What is that direction that he takes the party? And why is he so effective at winning over their support? That was a, a, a doubling down on the base. And that's as we see it today. And that was not no longer reaching out to to broaden the coalition, to bring in Hispanics or people of color. It worked because Donald Trump saw that he could he could kind of exacerbate the nativist um, ideas that were beginning to simmer uh, under the surface with again Newt Gingrich and, and all of those people previously and so he just leaned into that and clearly there was potency especially in the aftermath of Barack Obama having just been elected our first black president but this type of dysfunction from both sides has been happening for several decades and Donald Trump was basically the result of this dysfunction that had been happening for so long Jesus this is about a king and Riddler's the match. Some people want to watch the world burn. Well, well Bain's come to pull the pin on the grenade. Now they will elect a new chancellor. A strong chancellor. One who will not let our tragedy continue. His presidency was basically the validation of a lot of people's fears and distrust and anger towards the American government. That they wanted to see the changes that had been reported to them that would fit their own ideologies and agendas. Now, I guarantee you a lot of people are gonna say, but what about the Democrats? They're just as bad. Trust me, guys, there's plenty of things to criticize them for. Both sides are to blame in this situation. I will agree with that. But for time purposes, I'm not gonna get into the dysfunction on that side of the aisle because A, it'll take me too much time, and B, there's a lot more qualified people who could give you a more detailed explanation as to why. But with the way the Republican Party has been acting, especially over the last few years, in my estimation, and a lot of other people feel this way too, it's gone too far. And just to specify here, I am not saying that all Republicans want this kind of dysfunction to happen in the government just so they can have their own type of power. And there are reasonable Republicans out there that are taking a stand against this extreme form of the Republican Party and saying, no, this isn't what democracy should be. You guys are doing this the wrong way. 
But with all this history in mind and the known dysfunction that certain Republicans had against Democratic presidents, it almost kind of reminds me of how the League of Shadows approaches its fight against the dysfunction of society, especially in Gotham City. It is beyond saving and must be allowed to die. And certain Republicans, not all of them, but especially this form of Republicanism, wants to shrink government down to the bare bones so they can step in and rule the United States the way they want to. To tie all this back to Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, a lot of people pointed out the similarities between Palpatine and Donald Trump as far as him wanting to consolidate power in the Senate and the Galactic Republic. If you wish to become a complete and wise leader, you must embrace a larger view of the Force. And the fears have only been amplified with certain things that Trump has said about what he will do should he come back into office. I would have every right to go after them, and it's easy. Well, revenge does take time, I will say that. It does. And sometimes revenge can be justified. These people are, should be put in jail the way they talk about our judges and our justices, trying to get them to sway their vote, sway their decision. I think the bigger problem are the people from within. We have some very bad people. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics. And I think they're the, and, and it should be very easily handled by, if necessary, by National Guard, or if really necessary, by the military. What did you say? Every single Jedi, including your friend, Obi-Wan Kenobi, is now an enemy of the Republic. Wipe them out. All of them. He's gonna kill us all. And the remaining Jedi will be hunted down and defeated. How will the Emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. He wants to appoint people that are loyal to him, both as advisors, but also as cabinet members, and also, you know, as the head of the Department of Justice. So that when Trump says, I want to go after that guy, uh, the DOJ will say, yes, sir. Uh, and that, he, that anytime he says, you know, if he says something about, I want troops to go clear the National Mall before I go out there, they go, yes, sir. And there won't be anyone there to say, sir, you're out of line, think twice about this, what you're doing may be illegal. Uh, instead, they'll say, yes, sir, go do it. Not to mention the anxieties over Project 2025. Maybe some of it is overhyped by the media, or maybe it's not, but I've read some of what's in Project 2025, and if you really take it at face value, it's quite scary. What Donald Trump wants to do is reclassify all of those career civil servants as political appointees. Everybody from DOJ, FBI, FCC, IRS, and that would basically turn the federal government into a tool, a political tool of Donald Trump. Yeah, imagine like the FBI full of little mega Trump acolytes. Imagine uh, people in charge of food safety. I mean, yeah. like there's a reason you have nonpartisan career professionals in these jobs and Donald Trump wants to just fire them all. The FCC, for example, that's how you turn into North Korea style TV in the United States. Checks, balances, and a shredder. This would basically allow the president to replace all career civil servants with political appointees, which unto itself would turn the federal government into a tool of the Trump administration. The end of abortion. We know that this is their plan already, but this basically gives them a path to do exactly that by banning uh, abortion medication, for example. Pollute first, ask questions later. This would signal the end to our efforts to combat climate change and basically entrench our reliance on fossil fuels at the one moment that we have in on this precipice right here to actually do something about climate change. School's out forever. It would seek to eliminate the Department of Education, ban more books that don't comport with Republicans' narrow religious worldview, and it would funnel money away from public schools and toward private schools, charter schools with less government oversight and higher paychecks for those who own them. And finally, nuclear family supremacy. Here's the quote, families comprised of a married mother, father, and their children are the foundation of a well-ordered nation and a healthy society. Meaning if you're not those things, then you are part of an unhealthy society. It is egregiously anti LGBT, anti single people, unmarried people, and just really f gross. Weird too. Super weird. They want to bring back child labor, which I know you kind of support because you could edit more YouTube videos, but I think it's bad, and so do the viewers. It's not true. Uh, they want to put a lifetime it's not, cap not true. on Medicaid coverage so that really sick people either, I guess, go bankrupt or just die. 
uh, and they want to make prescription drugs more expensive so that big pharma can make more money selling them. They want to eliminate the separation of church and state so that people like Mike Pence, I guess, can slink into your bedroom, give you some pointers. If that's appealing to you, support Project 2025. Uh, and they want to outlaw being transgender. They want to cut federal funding for gender affirming care. Basically, they want to take Donald Trump's cruel campaign rhetoric about trans people and try to codify it into law. And then finally, they just, they, they hate diversity. They don't want the federal government to be diverse. They want you to be able to discriminate against people on the basis of sex and race and gender. So uh, they just want to make the government a terrible place filled by worse people that will do awful things. America's future will be bigger, better, bolder, brighter, happier, stronger, freer, greater, and more united than ever before. The movement back to harmony will be unstoppable this time. We are back to finish the job. And this time, no misguided idealists will get in the way. If someone stands in the way of true justice, you simply walk up behind them and stab them in the heart. Do you know what you're doing? I mean, do you realize what this will do to the country? Yes. This isn't freedom. This is fear. We never got it. We right. never said, well, wait, 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 wait. This isn't the right thing to do and we're still struggling with it. And that's what we're seeing over and over when Republicans take control and, and their ranks are filled with people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Jim Jordan and James Comer and Donald Trump, whose sole goal is to break government so they can point to it and say, look, that doesn't work, elect us because we want to shrink government down to nothing. I think the irony, especially for the Christians, is that that's very Nietzschean. See, Nietzsche said it's all about power. There's really no truth. It's all about power. They're like, we need to keep you down into where you are because we're afraid you're going to rise up. And it makes me wonder sometimes, what else are they not telling us about Project 2025? If Trump were to place his acolytes in charge of YouTube and order them to shut down anybody like content creators like myself for praising quote unquote liberal and woke propaganda or garbage or the pieces of media that have certain woke ideas as they see it, someone like me and other people who talk about entertainment on here could face some kind of repercussions. Even Hollywood could be affected by this too. Shows like The Last of Us with season two and beyond might not see the light of day. Certain MCU projects probably won't come to fruition either, like Captain America 4, which is set to be released next year. And even The Last of Us Part 3 might not ever happen either, because the video game industry could be affected by this too. I mean, given all of the people in the entertainment industry from Hollywood and the music scene who have spoken out against him and have supported Democratic candidates in the past, including Kamala Harris this year. I mean, how do you think that's going to go down if he sends law enforcement and the military after them to arrest them or even possibly shoot them on sight just because they don't support him or his ideas, let alone Democratic officials and the average American who doesn't support him? I, I don't see how that could lead to anything but actually civil disorder. And that's probably the big thing about Donald Trump that scares a lot of people and I'll admit, that's probably the one thing that scares me the most. Donald Trump, who had donated to Democrats, donated to Kamala Harris, had Bill and Hillary Clinton at his wedding, uh, had been all over the place, thought about running for president as a libertarian, had argued that he should, we should be pro-choice, and then he's the guy that appoints justices that take away the right to an abortion uh, in terms of a constitutional right. I mean, principles has never really been a thing for him. Exactly. It's, where, it's wherever the wind blows. He saw there was an opportunity to exploit a Republican base, and he said whatever he needed to say to consolidate power among those people, and if that means he has to change his position on abortion, on taxes, on social issues, that's exactly what he's going to do, because again, it is not about following any long-standing principles or values or or morals. It is about the consolidation of power by any means necessary. And some people have seen this as another opportunity for Donald Trump to turn America into a different kind of government that a lot of his followers may want, but it might not be exactly what America really needs or what most Americans really want. Great group, and they're going to lay the groundwork and detail plans for exactly what our movement will do and what your movement will do when the American people give us a colossal mandate to save America, and that's coming. Heritage Foundation president, somebody else doing an unbelievable job. He's bringing it back to levels it's never seen. Dr. Kevin Roberts. Get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? 
It'll be fixed. It'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore. So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. Understand also what happened in the last few months when the Supreme Court essentially told the former president he will be immune from anything he does in office. So whereas before there was at least some threat of consequence and accountability. When there is a dramatic shift in power, history is full of examples where the revolutionary force is just as bad as what was there before. He has control of the Senate and the courts. Imagine Donald Trump based on everything we know about him and everything we see now and before. Imagine him with no guardrails. Because all of those folks who worked with him before, they're not, those who held him back, who attempted to ensure that he would follow the law, are no longer there. And, and we have the Supreme Court decision. So the stakes are very high. That's the level of danger we're seeing to democracy right now, that a few decades away, this may not be a recognizable country if some serious changes are not undertaken in our electorate and if serious reforms are not undertaken in our politics. You saw what happened in Valencia earlier today. This is going to be worse. And even during Trump's presidency, someone like Bill Maher suggested that Trump will not concede an election if he loses. He is not someone who can take loss. He's just going to say it's rigged, it's unfair, I'm really still the president, I really still won, and then I don't know what happens. What do you know, on January 6th, he encouraged a violent mob of his followers to storm the Capitol building and stop the peaceful transfer of power. This is your opinion? It's a fact. To this day, he still refuses to admit that he lost. And a lot of people I know who are supporters of his actually believe that Joe Biden stole the election. You still have no proof. And with those people that I mentioned from the Daily Wire, like Candace Owens or Ben Shapiro, a lot of people that I know personally, they listen to these people on a regular basis. But when I hear some of the things that they say, I find it kind of unsettling. David Pakman does not have a soul. He doesn't have a soul. It makes me wonder if I were to challenge some of my friends who are conservative or Republican, would they feel the same way about me that Candace Owens has to say about anyone who feels the opposite on politics and social issues? Every single Jedi, including your friend, Obi-Wan Kenobi, is now an enemy of the Republic. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. People literally see the other side as the enemy. When you have Trump people wearing a t-shirt that says, I'd rather be with the Russians than with the Democrats, you have crossed this line. They don't even realize that that's treason. If you like Vladimir Putin better than Nancy Pelosi, you don't even realize it. You've crossed that line to treasonous behavior. And it, it really means the other side isn't really just wrong. They're kind of evil. You have allowed this dark lord to twist your mind until now. Until now, you have become the very thing you swore to destroy. What I'm scared of is the millions of people that follow him, that believe in his ideology. I know in my head that that's not true. Sometimes a person's tone or the sense of disdain in their voice, that can tell a lot of people otherwise. Hell, even my own father, who's gone full on MAGA at this point, along with some relatives on his side of the family, I wouldn't be surprised if they would try to disown me just because I don't think the same way as they do. Now, I realize that some of what I said earlier runs along the lines of fear-mongering, but even then, if there's a chance that something like that can happen, is it really worth the risk of Trump not possibly doing any of those things or maybe even putting some of those ideas in place? And I think what we could all learn from Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, we gotta be very careful with who we elect into public office. Once you allow an elected leader to take away some people's rights, it's only gonna make them wanna take away another right, and then another, and only the rights of other people that they deem to be less than superior. But there's always reasons to hope too, because if this election year is any indication, there is always someone who is willing to stand up to the big guy and say, no, you're not gonna do this anymore. Even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree Look them in the eye and say, no, you move.
A Kamala Harris victory, if it were to happen, in the eyes of many people, could be along the lines of the entire galaxy and the Resistance teaming up against the Final Order, and Rey defeating the Emperor once and for all saying, no, you are not coming back. In fact, on that note, to think about it in relationship terms, this might be something that we need to remind ourselves of. You continue seeing that guy right there, you're gonna have major, major problems. Like always some let me, let me get. listen, I believe that, but you know what? I also understand when relationships fall apart, sometimes people turn to their past looking for something that they're familiar with. There's a reason why people are in your past. There really is. And going back there and revisiting it, not usually a good thing. And especially with this guy. The only request I have for America, put your policies aside for one minute and consider this idea. Do you really want to go back to someone who says that they want to be a dictator on day one? Or would you rather go with someone who wants to pave a new way forward? If you really want all your liberties to die, then be my guest. But if you really want to move on from a bunch of chaos... Make your choice.